It is a great pleasure. I think we can get started to introduce uh, Dr. Martin Fichet. Uh, I always try and pronounce that correctly. I never do. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Martin did, is a psychiatrist who was trained in the Netherlands, uh, did his uh, residency part of it in the IOP in London. Um, and he really is, I think, a world leader in um, DBS, uh, using neuromodulation to, tr to treat disorders like OCD and Parkinson's and other things. Um, and I think it's, you know, this kind of whole concept of circuit-based treatments is an emerging area. And uh, through his work and the work of others in his group uh, and the larger group uh, here at Sinai, I think Sinai is becoming leaders in DBS and neuromodulation. And um, it's, it was, I think, a wonderful recruitment to bring you on board. And I think uh, you and your colleagues, uh, who will also be presenting here soon, um, really have are changing the landscape for some of these very difficult to treat cases of OCD and Parkinson's and other things like that. So I look forward to your talk and thank you for agreeing um, to be one of the early speakers in the fall series. Thank you, it's a pleasure and an honor. So you just mentioned my colleagues uh, and I want to start with giving a shout out to them. Usually you do that at the end, but I want to stress how important it is to be a center, which we are, uh, the Center for Advanced Circuit Therapeutics, which is uh, primarily based here at Mount Sinai West, which is where I'm now on the 10th floor for those uh, who haven't been here, come and visit us. It's, it's really great that Mount Sinai gave us the opportunity to be on a floor uh, with a team of uh, neurologists, neurosurgeons, psychiatrists, psychologists, and researchers. Again, this is usually the last slide, but I want to show it up front also to uh, remind you all how um, important it is to have this team approach, this multidisciplinary team approach with uh, staff that's actually on this floor as well as staff across Mount Sinai that we're collaborating with in order to be able to uh, not only uh, work with, um, like clinically work with very treatment resistant, severely ill patients that are undergoing surgery, but also of course, on top of that doing research to understand their circuit abnormalities and how to manipulate them. Um, and where we start and with which patients is, of course, uh, an important question if you want to do circuit therapy. So I'm, I'm going to talk mostly uh, about deep brain stimulation, um, but eventually this could apply to any form of uh, neuromodulation now or in the future. So where we start uh, often or a system that's actually amenable a large brain system that's amenable to neuromodulation is the cortical basal ganglia circuit, or these are actually different circuits, um, um, allowing the integration of daily actions with cognitions and uh, emotions or uh, reward-based information. Uh, two motor and prefrontal cortical regions, which can actually be subdivided into topographically organized levels from dorsal to ventral with the most dorsal loops or pathways uh, between motor basal ganglia, for instance, the putamen, the subthalamic nucleus, the globus pallidus interna, uh, connecting to uh, motor cortical regions, which is uh, important for movement disorders, which we treat as well at our center, uh, but also for uh, psychiatric disorders, such as obsessive compulsive disorder uh, or Tourette, which is sort of between neurology and psychiatry. And then going a little bit more down, there's the more uh, cognitive or associative circuits between, for example, the caudate and the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex, important for cognitive control and working memory and the integration uh, of these systems with actions. And then 
uh, all the way down to the more the most ventral loops are, are of course limbic limbic circuits, limbic or motivational circuits uh, between, uh, for example, the accumbens, the amygdala, and medial and orbital frontal cortical regions, which is relevant for many of the psychiatric conditions that we treat. But of course, there's interaction between these circuits. Um, and there's interaction between these circuits in each patient, whether it's neurological or psychiatric, which is one of the big reasons why we chose to work multidisciplinary and work with within psychiatry and neurology. Um, and the way to uh, manipulate or mod modulate these circuits is, for example, uh, with a non-invasive technique called uh, transcranial magnetic stimulation, which is something we, we started doing at Mount Sinai uh, around two years ago. It's a, a system that's housed uptown, but we're, uh, we're looking into moving it to, to west now. Um, and it can be used to, uh, to modulate motor cortical regions, the SMA or the primary motor cortex um, in Parkinson's. It's actually pretty effective, um, but also in Tourette or in obsessive compulsive disorder. Uh, it's even a recently FDA approved treatment for obsessive compulsive disorder. Interestingly, if you, if you target mo uh, prefrontal cortical regions in Parkinson's, you also treat their depression. Um, and that's, it's not surprising, therefore, that the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex is also an effective target for depression. And if you go more ventral, you can uh, modulate the medial prefrontal cortex or e even the orbital frontal cortex, uh, which allows you to, to change these limbic circuits, uh, which is an effective treatment for um, OCD, but also for depression. Now, if you want to get at these more deeper structures and also in a more lasting way, because TMS is a treatment that you can apply for a couple of weeks, if it doesn't work after the application, you, it's hard to, to continue applying it. <clears throat> Patient has to come to the office. So if you want to go uh, at these deeper structures, you can actually implant uh, a lead or two leads, usually um, going to, for example, motor structures like the subthalamic nucleus or the GPI for Parkinson's. Um, or um, the more limbic loops, like the interior limb of the internal capsule, the alic or the ventral alic, which connects these limbic basal ganglia with medial prefrontal cortical regions. And it's actually the target of choice here in Mount Sinai for obsessive compulsive disorder. Um, and um, the target of choice uh, for depression in our center is the subcolosal singlet, which is not exactly within these loops, but at least it's connected to the ventral striatum and the amygdala, but it's also connected to a more elaborate uh, mood control circuit involving various cortical regions. And of course, that's the target that Helen Mayberg uh, has uh, examined for years and now brought to Mount Sinai for depression. Um, we started targeting the ventral alic um, by actually targeting the accumbens, which as you can see is a little below. So the ventral alic is actually this bundle of white matter fibers connecting um, the, the, the accumbens with a medial prefrontal regions and uh, thalamus and brainstem. <clears throat> and uh, although we started, we and other groups started targeting the accumbens because we, we knew it was an important structure for reward. And also we found abnormalities in obsessive compulsive disorder. We ended up uh, going uh, and, and activate uh, the contacts because each lead has four contacts 
that were always more uh, in the ventral interior, interior capsule. This is actually something that has happened over time in DBS in general, especially DBS in psychiatry. We used to, we used to target gray matter structures, but only to find out over time that actually most effectively uh, treatment was usually in white matter fibers. Um, again, making the argument that it's more of a, of a, of a network um, um, intervention. So this is the way we used to do it. It's actually an atlas-based uh, coordinate uh, that you then um, um, translate onto the patient's brain scan, and then you can actually place the lead specifically in this coordinate. But it's sort of a one-size-fits-all because it's, it, it's atlas and coordinate-based. Um, nevertheless, working pretty good. So this is, uh, the, 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 these are the most recent results from um, my previous uh, Amsterdam group, which I, I'm still uh, sort of involved in. Um, and as you can see, it works. These are, again, severely ill, completely um, refractory patients, and at least half of them respond, even though it's sort of a one-size-fits-all um, uh, intervention. Um, um, it also works for depression and anxiety, as you can see, by the drop in Hamilton A and Hamilton D scores, which is one of the reasons we also try this same target in a group of depressed patients with also uh, very uh, good results. Um, and this is, these are all open results um, in 70 patients, but we also have um, placebo-controlled or sham stimulation-controlled results showing a, um, a significant difference between real and, and sham stimulation. And this is one of the reasons why for OCD now, deep brain stimulation is an, is an FDA uh, approved, um, although still um, also experimental treatment. Um, however, 50% is okay, but it still leaves room for opportunity, which is what I and our group want to try and achieve here at Mount Sinai. One of the thing we found in uh, our Amsterdam patients is, and these are 12 patients uh, using uh, individualized uh, diffusion tangier imaging, is two things. One thing you can see in these 12 patients that uh, despite the fact that the atlas-based or the MR-based coordinate is pretty similar in each patient, uh, if you overlay that with their tractography, it's really uh, dif dif different in each patient. So the, the, the way these bundles, these limbic uh, bundles that we try to target course in each patient is highly uh, variable. Um, and in this, these 12 patients, we actually found that that's um, not a trivial thing. It's, it's important because we found that like the, the, the top patients uh, that have a larger Y-box decrease, Y-box is of course uh, the most prominent uh, OCD outcome, um, the more likely they, they were in, in one versus the other uh, ALIC track. In our hands, this was a track that was seeded from uh, the ventral tegmental area uh, versus one that uh, was more uh, medial uh, coming from the interior thalamus. At the same time, other European centers uh, were uh, exploring uh, like a similar question, uh, but they didn't have the, the luxury of using uh, individualized tractography, which needs to be of high quality. So they used normative, uh, uh, tr uh, like healthy control based. Uh, tractography data overlaid with the patient's implants. And this is uh, work from uh, Andreas Horn, who's a prominent DBS neuroscientist, who was trained in one of the other uh, circuit uh, therapeutic centers here at Harvard, and now works in Berlin. And this is 
um, um, results from a meta-analysis in um, 33 ventral alic OCD patients across different centers in uh, Madrid, in Berlin, Grenoble. Um, and as you can see, um, there's actually a wide variety of most of the uh, basal ganglia cortical loops that I showed before that are actually uh, connected to the stimulated contacts from all of these patients grouped together. You can see some amygdala fibers, fibers going to the uh, prefrontal regions, uh, some motor fibers and fibers going to the brainstem. However, if you, uh, if you only plot the ones that um, 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 had a good response or actually correlate them with the amount of response, you'll find that these therapeutic fibers are more alike what we showed in our uh, Amsterdam sample, uh, meaning fibers going from the brainstem and the thalamus to these uh, prefrontal regions. Um, the, the Mount Sinai patients, uh, I think we've done 14 so far. Uh, this is results from, from 10 of them are actually al along the same lines in terms of response. Again, it's an it's a average 44% decrease in Y-box, which is pretty good for these uh, refractory patients. And it's also significant. And again, this is mostly based on coordinate-based uh, targeting, but it's, it's a very decent result. Um, and if we tried to overlay and this is work by Andrew Smith, who's following um, a physician research track uh, uh, working with us. Um, if you overlay that to the, the, the MEDA track from the European sample, you can see that the leads from our patients are uh, sometimes in this track, sometimes outside of it. In fact, there's also a blue track going, going to the amygdala that I... Uh, depicted uh, before that was actually negatively uh, correlated to uh, to response so it seems to matter where you are uh, again this is based on normative data um, and if you correlate like the response like the Y box improvement in our Mount Sinai patients again it seems to overlap with these uh, fibers going from the brainstem and the thalamus uh, to prefrontal regions. So the, the more, um, the higher the fiber score, the more overlap with this track and the higher their uh, response on the Y box. You can also see a few patients that do have a good response, but are not in this track. Uh, when we modeled this, this was actually more uh, towards the dorsal pathways. Um, so there seem, seems to be individual variety, which is important uh, because that might be the key to further improving this treatment. I want to have you uh, look at uh, a poor responder. Um, and this is a patient, uh, I'm going to show you a video, by the way, I'm going to show several videos, uh, of course, um, um, in agreement with uh, each individual uh, because I think it's important for you all to see um, like the effects of this method in actual patients is one of the reason why uh, it's so inspiring to to do this work uh, and why it's um, so um, um, interesting to to look at these tracks because you can actually see the immediate effects um, of this method. So this was a patient, this was one of the poor responders of the Mount Sinai cohort. His compulsions are religious. So he's, he's, he's it, it is literally taking him hours to, to, to say his prayer. Uh, and he's also engaged in all sorts of hand washing rituals. And as you can see, uh, we did actually with his stimulation as we applied it trial and error, um, um, we did actually engage these amygdala fibers, which might, according to the meta-analysis, actually be negatively correlated with response. 
but we didn't engage these brainstem prefrontal or thalamic fibers. And this is the patient being engaged in his compulsive ritual. I have to make sure that I'm actually also sharing sound. Yeah, I do. I thought of something in the middle. We need to interrupt the case to start all over again. So um, we modeled uh, a different setting, activating one more dorsal contact. And now we did actually get these uh, fibers that are associated with therapeutic effects. And right after we, 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 we made this change as modeled, you can see the result. Now all of a sudden you can hear um, uh, him actually um, saying his prayer much faster, like three times faster, and also very fluent. So um, you can probably understand now why it's so inspiring uh, because because you can see these immediate effects, and this was actually um, one of the good responders, which I depicted here. And um, this is one of the most recent patients where we actually applied uh, tractography informed targeting. So um, Kisung and I work with Dr. Coppel, our nurse surgeon, to, um, to, not, to actually leave the method of coordinate based uh, or atlas based targeting but really targeting at these specific tracks, uh, which as far as I know, uh, only a few centers are starting to do. But if you do so, um, at least so far, uh, you can see very immediate uh, effects. So this is a patient with all sorts of men mental compulsive rituals. It's very hard to engage him into uh, 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 an interview he's constantly preoccupied with these rituals he's also uh, moving his body um, and, and he's, he's constantly counting um, and this was one of the patients that we actually were able to implant like right in this the therapeutic tract as you can see here and when we activated his uh, neurostimulator uh, we saw an immediate response with the patient becoming more engaged um, and actually forgetting about most of his compulsive rituals. And up, up, up till today, this, we're now one year after surgery, he's still doing very well. Um, of course, I'm also hugely inspired by uh, Hal Mayberg's results so far, which is basically um, this method. So in her patients, in her Emory cohorts, um, with uh, working with her group, um, some of them who are now here, um, she was actually able to, to show um, an enormous improvement of outcome uh, using this method, um, where the efficacy or the effects of subcolosal DBS uh, improved from 40 to around 70 to now uh, over 80% using tractography based targeting and programming. And um, so, so this means that there's definitely room for improvement um, and that we shouldn't um, uh, be happy with the 50% that we're getting now. Uh, looking at the ALIC, it's interesting to learn from tracer studies and human tractography studies, for example, those from Susan Haber's group um, depicted here um, to see that the ALIC is actually projecting to different cortical regions. So, um, so could we pre precise our targeting by looking at these cortical projections in each patient? So you see the ALIC, 
um, and you, you can actually see that the lateral parts of the internal capsule are projecting to the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex and the ventral lateral prefrontal cortex. The most ventral part is going to the ventral medial and OOC, and then the more medial parts of the ALIC are projecting to the dorsal ACC and the dorsal medial prefrontal cortex. And Ki Sung Choi, uh, our neuroimager, was actually able to show in our patients, in the Mount Sinai patients, uh, if you average, average their uh, tractography maps to uh, the stimulated regions, uh, the same regions came up uh, in our patients, meaning that, our, that uh, the way we uh, use DBS now in these patients, we're also modulating these various cortical projections of the ALIC. Um, and in fact, um, we, we could see that it's important for uh, the response. You can see here plotted um, the, the number of of streamlines from the region where we end up stimulating in, these, in each patient to these cortical projections. And you see that responders sort of share uh, projections to all of these cortical regions. However, the non-responders seem to have overlapped to some of these cortical projections, for, for example, those most ventral, uh, but not so much to uh, dorsal lateral or ventral lateral. They seem to lack um, um, those streamlines at least uh, less than the responders. Um, and it might even be like was also showed in this meta-analysis um, uh, that there are uh, negative tracks which may delay or even negatively influence uh, the outcome. In our hands, uh, this ventral medial prefrontal um, a track which was actually correlated with um, a negative response. Uh, so is there a way to selectively uh, stimulate each of these pathway in each patient? And yes, there is. There are now available, commercially available directional leads with which you can actually selectively and directionally stimulate in the lateral and medial directions at least for the middle two contacts. Um, and Kisum was able to, to show with these electric field models that um, they are actually um, applicable to modulating these different cortical regions. So uh, we found uh, when we model it that the lateral segments are actually able to connect to dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex and ventral lateral prefrontal cortex as predicted. And then the medial ones would take you to dorsal medial and dorsal ACC, where the, whereas the lowest contact would go to ventral medial prefrontal cortex and orbital frontal cortex. So that's all fine, but which are the ones that are optimal for OCD? And how can we use these for individual patients? Um, this is a patient um, with like really outspoken motor compulsions. It can take him hours to walk through a door uh, because it doesn't feel right. It needs to go back and forth, as you can see here on the day of his surgery. And we imagine that ventral lateral prefrontal cortical stimulation might really help this patient because my previous work showed that uh, ALIC DBS is actually able to normalize uh, VLPFC activation associated to motor inhibitory control in patients with OCD. So uh, we modeled um, these fibers going to the ventral lateral prefrontal cortex, which again would be uh, one of the segmental um, uh, contacts. Um, and we were able to, uh, to show with this very selective segmented setting um, that he uh, was able to, to walk fluently again. Um, this is a patient where we applied this method, so selective stimulation uh, intraoperatively. Um, Dolu is one of our researchers that greatly helped me set up video and sound and also 
uh, like sliders with which we can selectively measure different symptomatic outcomes to intraoperative stimulation. You can see the patient here with a stereotactic frame that the surgeon needs to, uh, to steer uh, the implantation to the right target. Uh, this is the patient uh, before we activate the system. And you can see right after activating the system, he starts to smile, especially with this first ventral medial orbital frontal connection. It's actually also sort of a unilateral um, smile, which is interesting. This is right-sided stimulation. And it's actually prescribed in the literature before, probably connected to um, like an amygdala uh, motor uh, uh, fiber. And you can also see like when we uh, plotted his symptom responses, like a huge uh, in increase in specifically motivation, not so much mood, which aligns to like these, the function of these uh, motivational limbic fibers, um, as well as a, um, a selective improvement with this lateral, presumably ventral lateral prefrontal cortex uh, tar um, uh, contact. So this is very promising that you can already see intraoperatively the, the sort of use case of, of, of very selective stim. So now we have to find out uh, what is actually the right sort of stimulation map for all of our patients as well as individual patients. So this is a study that we're about to run here at Mount Sinai where uh, we are individual, individual, individually targeting 20 patients using tractography as shown before. Uh, then every two months we're um, measuring their outcomes as well as behavioral tasks that map onto different circuits, which I will show you in a minute. And then after one year, we'll pick apart responders from non-responders and uh, try to uh, differentiate the, their stimulated targets or tracks. Um, and uh, working with uh, Chaussi and Vincenzo from the computational lab, we've designed uh, a battery of tasks that actually tap into these different circuits for motor control, for reward positive and negative reward prediction, uh, and for uh, uh, reversal learning and flexible control. And so each two months, uh, we're trying to, to map outcomes with these tasks onto selective STEM, which is great for exploring uh, like individual targets for each patient, but it also gives you a nice almost Ardocian map of uh, task outcomes uh, associated to stimulation in, uh, in these different circuits. Alison Waters um, uh, has a great uh, EEG tool, which we also use uh, in this study where she was actually able to show that with selective STIM, you can actually, you can, uh, she was able to demonstrate also selective uh, EEG signatures in response to the stimulation measured on the, on the scalp. Uh, so you can see here um, these different signatures, uh, which is something that we're gonna use also um, in these 20 OCD patients. So what about motor DBS? Um, is that really motor? So DBS for Parkinson's, of course, is targeted at these typical motor circuits, for example, the subthalamic nucleus or the globus pallidus internus, uh, connecting to motor cortical regions. But we know uh, that these circuits of course are uh, interconnected with the more associative and also limbic circuits. Um, and we also know this is, these are results from uh, Mount Sinai Parkinson's patients. 
um, that we measured during their deep brain stimulation screening. So these are regular medication treated Parkinson's patients. Um, so we know from these patients that their motor symptoms are dopamine dependent. Of course, Parkinson's is um, uh, in part uh, dopamine depletion. So if you take these patients off of their dopamine substitution therapy, you'll see uh, an enormous increase in their motor symptoms, for example, tremor and rigidity. That's something we knew. What we didn't know was whether their non-motor symptoms, like their mood uh, or symptoms that are prevalent in Parkinson's like compulsivity, uh, anxiety or apathy, are also dopamine dependent. And indeed, some of them are. Uh, apathy most prominently, which is lack of motivation. Um, if you take patients off of their dopaminergic medication, you see their um, A motivational, the apathy scores increase. This was measured with the Stark team apathy skill to assess. Um, we also saw significant differences, but now the other way around for compulsivity and impulsivity. So things like hypersexuality, compulsive eating, gambling, spending. These are measured with a skill called the QUIP. Um, uh, and there you see the reverse pattern. So more compulsivity and more impulsivity with patients on uh, dopaminergic medication. There was not a significant difference between these two states for depression and anxiety. Uh, so, so far it seems that mostly apathy and compulsivity are dopaminergic dependent uh, behaviors which are not traditionally addressed with DBS because it's mostly focused at these motor parts of the subthalamic nucleus. However, that might be very important. Uh, that might be actually um, important to, to target these uh, non-motor circuits because what we see, and this is actually also something that's seen in media analysis across the world, that many patients with uh, subthalamic DBS and Parkinson's, despite having a, a very good motor outcome, still suffer from apathy or lack of motivation. In our Mount Sinai cohort, actually half of the patients score above the cutoff of apathy. So those patients typically tell their neurologist that they uh, don't feel that much improved, even though their motor scores show that they have beautifully improved. Uh, but they don't seem to be able to motivate themselves to get up from their chairs and move, despite the fact that their um, uh, motor symptoms have greatly improved. Um, this is a patient with apathy and a high score on the apathy scale that actually reversed after stimulating uh, a different contact. You can see that also his motor scores improve a little bit, at least he's less dyskinetic, uh, but definitely he looks much more uh, alive and less apathetic. And this is also something he reported again immediately after we adjusted his stimulation settings. So this shows that uh, contrary to like what is currently believed mostly in the field of neurology, um, this sort of motor DBS can actually also be used to address these non-motor symptoms. And that makes sense because if you look at, um, um, at the projections of um, the subthalamic target uh, modeled in uh, our Parkinson's patients, you can actually see that where we stimulate, again, this is usually targeted at the dorsal STN for uh, motor circuits and motor symptoms. Um, there's also definitely connections to these associative and limbic regions. And actually when we compare patients with apathy uh, to those with no apathy after DBS, this is a work uh, with Lucia Bederson, um, who's a medical student uh, doing um, research with us, we can show 
that the apathetic patients had a, actually missing engagement of mostly these limbic uh, projections, uh, which is an interesting finding. Um, I mean, most in the field tend to believe uh, again that like apathy is, is not something uh, that is am amenable to DBS. And if so, it, it, it's often believed that it's a side effect. But here we show that it's actually something that's, um, that's being missed in current stimulation uh, uh, methods. Allison again was able to find also uh, an a, a effective, like sort of functional readout uh, of this limbic stimulation. So here, this is one patient using the same method that we also use for OCD and actually also for depression. When we stimulate the ventral contact, we can see um, uh, engagement of these prefrontal uh, limbic uh, pathways. So this is useful uh, for uh, studying how to best actually target these limbic prefrontal regions if we want to reverse apathy, which is something that we're uh, about to do in a study where in existing Mount Sinai patients, we are first further mapping these uh, apathy maps by comparing patients with uh, and without apathy after motor DBS. And then we uh, use a second cohort of prospective patients, uh, wait and see if they do or don't develop apathy. If they do, we're trying to adjust their stimulation setting towards getting the non-apathy map of our first cohort. And then of course, see if they improve in terms of motivation and apathy scores, and not at the cost, hopefully, of um, their motor outcomes. This is one patient uh, where, we, uh, where we tried this successfully. Uh, so the patient had apathy uh, and as expected was relatively lacking limbic connections. Did have, have, did have good motor and some associative connections, but not so much those limbic prefrontal connections. Um, and when we modeled um, uh, a setting which would give us the limbic connections modeled onto our uh, group maps that I just showed you uh, and adjusted the stimulation accordingly, uh, we were able to decrease this patient's uh, apathy scores from 20 to, to 12 without actually adverse events showing that it's actually a very promising technique that of course we have to further back up with, uh, with, with a larger number of, of patients to base our maps on. Um, that brings me to the end of uh, what I wanted to share with you today, ending again with uh, this group of great people to work with. Uh, we have different other pro projects in the pipeline um, Alison Waters, for example, is, um, is trying to uh, decipher the brain circuits underlying urges to, to tick and compulsions, which is, may also be relevant for neuromodulation of addiction. Um, of course, um, we're, um, we're, we're having very promising ongoing work with uh, Helen's subcolosal patients. I'm very impressed so far with the first two patients that we implanted here at Mount Sinai. Uh, it seems to be very precise and very immediate also in terms of their outcomes, which is again very inspirational for me to try to achieve also in uh, the OCD and Parkinson's patients. We have very interesting work with Chaussi's lab uh, and Alex um, using voltammetry where we're able to intraoperatively measure dopamine and serotonin and noradrenaline, which will be hugely interesting also for like a biomarker of uh, selective stim in uh, ROCD patients. Um, we're working with 
Stephen Heist, who is uh, an expert in uh, uh, facial expression and speech analysis, which we can actually apply to these videos that I showed you to maybe pick up more subtle changes than we're able to, to catch with our uh, traditional skills. And then I have a very uh, interesting project with people from Hopkins where we try to target um, a substantia nigra uh, sensory cortex uh, circuit for patients with schizophrenia uh, with very promising results in, in the first uh, patient. Um, so with that, I, I would like to really end uh, uh, and um, welcome uh, questions and discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. <clears throat> so uh, uh, as a reminder, use the Q&A uh, function oh, yes. to ask questions. That was to everybody but you, Martin. But uh, if you want to read them or I can read them to you. Do you see them? Shari is the first question. It's a question about trans. Well, a patient recently mentioned transcranial direct current stimulation, TDCS. I wasn't able to find much info about it. Would you comment on it? It was endorsed by a member of our Sinai faculty. Uh, we do use, I mean, I, I know the addiction group uses transcranial direct current stimulation, which is, uh, a, it's a little different, but, but comparable to transcranial magnetic stimulation. It has the advantage of being more flexible. You can also, also apply it even in the home setting, uh, which is one of the reasons it's being used for uh, addiction research. It's not something we're using so far um, in our neuromodulation center. Um, yeah, for, for various reasons, but we, we, um, we use transcranial magnetic simulation, which seems to be a, a little bit more precise uh, in terms of targeting than uh, TDCS. But it has shown some promising results also in OCD and uh, depression. Thank you. Then is uh, another question. You mentioned the possibility of hitting negative tracks that negatively correlate with positive outcomes. Did any of these patients actually develop worse OCD symptoms after the abuse? That's an interesting question. So far, uh, we either see no or little response, like below the 35% responder um, threshold. Um, not particularly uh, aversive or negative outcomes. So I, I think I, sh I should reframe that. Um, like the one patient that I show you with the compulsive prayer, we did hit the so-called negative track, which was supposedly this amygdala fugal tract. Uh, and I must say that he did uh, report some anxiolytic effects with this kind of stimulation. It just did, didn't affect uh, his OCD. So I'm not sure even if these are really negative tracks, but maybe they just target uh, other symptom constellations, which may or may not be relevant for this particular patient. I must say that uh, side, side effects are actually pretty rare uh, with deep brain stimulation and if we see them it's actually very easy to uh, to reverse them by changing or lowering the stimulation. In fact many patients are able to to stop their medication uh, once success, successfully treated with deep brain stimulation which uh, greatly contributes to uh, uh, like the experience of less side effects also in the in the Parkinson's patients. That was a fantastic talk and really exciting. I wish I was working in that space, but it's too late. <laughs> um, yeah, I think it's really elegant work. It's nice to see the, the integration of uh, MRI information and tractography. That's really an amazing step forward. Um, I if anybody has any last question, I'm sure Martina will be happy to take it. Otherwise, we'll see you in a couple of weeks again. Well, we'll see you actually in November. We're going to pause this seminar series um, for October. Okay. 
thank you all. Thank you, Martin. You're welcome. It's a great talk and we really appreciate it. And thank you all the participants. Okay, thank you. Bye-bye.